So thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation to speak today. So we know that um, plants continually grow throughout their lifespan to adapt their architecture in response to the environment. And this continual growth is dependent on the maintenance of structures known as meristems, as we've just heard lots about. And all land plants have meristems. Um, despite many differences, they can share some key features. For example, they contain one or more stem cells within a stem cell niche. And this in turn gives rise to an undifferentiated proliferative zone, which will produce the outer and inner tissue layers of the plant body. And because meristems are three-dimensional structures, we must view them in multiple planes by physical sections and optical sections, as we've seen in the previous talk. And this allows us to clearly see the anatomy and gene expression profiles of the meristem. So we know a lot about how um, the meristem is regulated in flowering plants, but we know much less about meristem regulation in other lineages, such as the bryophytes. A Marcantia polymorpha is a bryophyte that's being increasingly used to understand plant development. There have been some really great papers in recent years that have identified the genetic regulators of meristems in the early stages of Marcantia growth. However, we don't know much about the three-dimensional structure of the meristems at these early stages, or how these structures compare to the meristems of the mature plant. And in my research, I'm interested in understanding how the branching architectures of the mature plants are formed by meristem regulation. And so the first aim of my project was um, to describe the 3D anatomy in the mature meristem. So in order to do this, I grew wild type plants for four weeks in white light and harvested the apices um, of the plant. So in Marcantia, the meristem is located at the base of this notch-like structure. And in fixed and cleared samples in this optical section, we can distinguish the individual um, cell types. Marcantia is generally believed to contain one stem cell known as the apical cell, as shown in dark blue. And this divides to produce daughter cells, which together form the stem cell niche. And this stem cell niche will produce the outer cell layers, as shown in green, as well as the inner tissue layers of the plant body, as shown in orange. And although Marcantia may look flat, it's actually composed of many cell layers in the dorsal ventral axis. So this includes dorsal structures, such as air pores, and ventral structures, such as rhizoids. So because the meristem is a three-dimensional structure, we need to um, view the meristem in multiple anatomical planes. So this includes the frontal plane, which divides the dorsal and ventral sides of the plant body, the sagittal plane, which divides the left and right sides of the plant body, and the transverse plane, which divides the apical and basal sides. And the section I just showed you is the frontal plane, and this is what's most typically reported in the Marcantia literature. In this plane, we see that the apical cell is um, trapezoid in shape and is located in the outer cell layer. And we can look at an optical reconstruction of the sagittal plane. And in this plane, we see that the stem cell itself is triangular and still located in the outer cell layer. However, the ventral cursor. Um, the ventral, the stem cell niche is located on the ventral side of the meristem. It's also surrounded by these single cell layered protrusions known as scales. In the sagittal plane, we again see that the stem cell niche is located on the ventral side of the plant body and surrounded by these single cell layered scales. So what's clear is that the anatomy of the mature meristem is distinct in each plane. And this highlights the importance of using a three-dimensional approach to understand the Marcantia meristem. So I've showed you the anatomy of the meristem in a mature plant, but how does this compare to the early stages of Marcantia development? So Marcantia can um, 
reproduce vegetatively by a small propagules known as gemmae, which form in these gemocups on the surface of the plant body. And whilst they're inside the cup, the gemmae are dormant. However, when they're removed, their meristems activate and they start to grow. So I wanted to see how meristem architecture was changing during these early stages of meristem activation. And in the frontal plane, we see that again, the stem cell niche is located at the base of the meristem, and this is true at all time points. However, there's a progressive increase in the width of the meristem as the gemma starts to bifurcate. In the sagittal section at day zero, we see that the stem cell niche is located at the apex of the gemma meristem, and this is true of day one. However, by day two and day three, the stem cells seem to be located on one side of the meristem. And to confirm that this corresponds to the ventral side, I looked at expression of the class three HTZIP translational report line, which is known to mark the dorsal surface. And this confirms that the apical cell becomes ventralized at later time points. In the transverse plane, we again see that the apical cell um, is centrally located at day zero, but by day two and day three is located on the ventral side of the meristem. We can also see an increase in the thickness of the meristem during these time points. So it's clear that the early gemma meristem is very different to the mature plant, but does, um, does the meristem continue to change or does it reach a stable anatomy? And so to test this, I fixed the meristems of plants at week one, week two, week three, and week four after transfer to media and imaged the meristems in the three different anatomical planes. And in these three different planes, I noticed no striking difference in the anatomy at these four time points. And so to verify this, I did some different measurements. So I first measured the position, the distance between the stem cell niche and the meristem apex, and found that this did not change during the four week time course. And I also measured the distance between the stem cell niche and the dorsal surface of the meristem. And again, this didn't change during the four weeks supporting that the meristem anatomy becomes stable after week one. And so I've shown you at day zero in the sagittal plane, the gemma meristem has dorsal ventral symmetry. However, by week one, the dorsal ventral asymmetry of the mature meristem is established and this structure is then maintained. So as we nicely saw in the previous talk, um, in flowering plants, there are discrete localization of gene expression within the meristem to control meristem anatomy. So I wanted to test if there are similar discrete domains of gene expression in the mature meristem of Marcantia. And to do this, I used a candidate approach using genes known to regulate meristems in Arabidopsis and in Marcantia. And for each Arabidopsis gene family, there was one Marcantia ortholog. So as mentioned earlier, class three HDZIPs are known to specify dorsal identity in Marcantia. In the frontal plane of the mature meristem, I detected no class three HDZIP expression. However, in the sagittal plane, we see that expression was restricted to the dorsal surface above the stem cell niche, consistent with its role in specifying dorsal identity. Class four HD zips are known to specify the epidermis in the meristem of Arabidopsis. And in Marcantia, we saw that the reporter lines were expressed in the outer cell layer and had stronger signal in the stem cell niche. This was also clear in the sagittal section where we see expression in the outer cell layer consistent with the role in, in outer cell layer specification. So clavata genes are transmembrane receptors that are known to regulate meristems in both Arabidopsis and Marcantia. And consistently, we see their expression at the plasma membrane, but also expressed across the whole meristem. We do also see a local depletion in the stem cell niche and in the surrounding outer cell layer. And finally, 
The yucca genes are known to be involved in auxin biosynthesis and have been shown to be um, localized to the Marcantia meristem. In the frontal plane, we see strong expression of the reporter within the stem cell niche. Um, and we see this also in the sagittal plane. However, the sagittal plane also reveals there is strong reporter signal in the cells directly above the stem cell niche. And so what I've shown you is that the reporter gene expression is restric restricted to discrete domains within the meristem, and that, that this is different in each of the three anatomical planes. And so to conclude, the Marcantia mature meristem anatomy and gene expression is distinct and asymmetric in each plane, unlike Arabidopsis thaliana. And the anatomical stability is established one week after Gemma activation. And this, so this leads us to conclude that the Gemma meristem is an arrested meristem that undergoes substantial anatomical rearrangement during the first week of growth before it reaches a, stru a stable structure, which then produces the mature body of the plant. So I'd like to thank everybody in the Dolan lab, particularly Liam for his support and Sophie for her help generating the lines and the VVC core facilities who are amazing. Thank you. Okay, that was wonderful. It's really beautiful imaging, Vicki. Um, so again, um, please put questions in the Q&A. Um, and while that's being populated, I have um, some questions. So uh, one is you start with this apical cell that's very much in the center, and then it moves um, uh, dor doris ventrally. Yeah. Doris okay. So how does it do that? Is there oh. is there more growth? Is there more division off of one plane? How does that shift? Yeah, I'm not entirely sure. So I don't know in terms of cell divisions. I think it'd be really nice to track where the um, higher rates of cell division are during that process. What is clear that it's based on the, the landing of the gemma. So when they're formed in the gemma cups, they are kind of go upwards. And then they can determine which side is the dorsal or ventral side, depending which way up they land. So it's definitely based on um, yeah, the light signals from the top and perhaps the cryotropic signals. Okay. Um, so another question is, um, you showed beautiful gene expression patterns, um, but that apical cell doesn't seem to have anything unique. So uh, is that a... a uh, is that true? <laughs> um, is that a common thing that, that apical cells don't have markers for them? Um, I'm hoping it's that we've not found them yet. So we have some other markers we've looked at recently that seem to be restricted to the apical cell and its daughter cells, so within the stem cell niche. So that they're quite specific to that region. But I have, we haven't yet found anything that is purely in that apical cell. I don't think that means it doesn't exist. I think it just means that we've not seen it yet. Um, okay. And lots of the reporter lines we know about, we don't necessarily know in this detail. So they could be expressed in one cell. We just need to do the optical sectioning to see. Got it. Got it. Yeah, I think your 3D view really changed at least my view of, of uh, what was going on in that region. That's good to know. Um, so there's a question from uh, Jill Harrison asking, have you thought about looking at the anatomy of the Marcantia pin mutants that have extra dorsal thallus lobes? Ah, no, I haven't, but I definitely should. That could be great. I think I've, yeah, it'd be really nice as well to see how that um, dorsal lobe activates. I think we, that's not really been very well characterized. And I think this technique gives us the opportunity to do it. So yeah, that's a great idea. Okay. And so one last question um, from Marcos uh, Gia Cortinez. Nice talk, Vicky. One question, is there a YABI proximodistal axis? So another... Um, hmm. um, another I don't know is pattern. the okay. answer, but it will be good to check. Okay. 